All right, so this is lecture 29. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly show you some of the interesting things from sections 3a and 3b of uh, Wolfgang Kuhnel's book on uh, differential geometry. Curves and surfaces manifold, second edition. This is a really, really excellent um, book. Very different than O'Neill. Um, the examples in that book are different. Um, the techniques are different. It's um, it's very nice. It's a very nice uh, thing to read following up from O'Neill. Um, anyway, so let's just get to it. What I want to describe mostly here today is the uh, first, second, and third form notations, all right? Now, essentially this is chapter 5 of O'Neill, um, and I'm not actually going to use Kuhnel's notation. I'm going to, I'm going to instead try to fit with uh, O'Neill's notation, notational scheme, which we've been using. So mathematically, our context is that of a, an embedded surface in R3, given the induced metric, all right? So we're, we've taken a step back from like the last couple lectures we had on abstract geometric surfaces. Here we're being slightly less abstract. In fact, much of this notation is very classical. Um, 19th century, I suppose. Anyway, the first fundamental form is just the dot product restricted to the surface, essentially. So here V and W are just uh, tangent vectors to M. And this is the first fundamental form. You could call it the induced metric also. The second fundamental form is the induced metric fed the shape, a shape operator acting on the one vector. Um, I suppose it's really to be perhaps you have to think of it as a, well, vectors or vector fields. Let's, let's not get into all that. But, um, so the, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, first fu fundamental form, uh, which is not a differential form, by the way. The first, second, and third form, we're going we're gonna to see there, in fact, they're bilinear forms. Actually, that's all. It's, it's clear enough that this is a bilinear form in V and W, um, and it's symmetric because the dot product is symmetric. Um, the symmetry of the second fundamental form is also true, but for that, you need the um, symmetry of the shape operator. Or as a, as as Kuhnel talks about it, the, the fact that it's self-adjoint with respect to the first fundamental form. Anyway, so and then the third fundamental form, which you see less of, um, it's the first fundamental fun, fundamental form fed the shape operator in in both arguments like that. Now there are of course various relations and so forth, but each one of these is a, um, a symmetric bilinear form on the the on M, the tangent spaced M actually at each point, right? So. I haven't written down the point dependence, but of course this is done point-wise and so forth. So, with respect to a particular patch, all right, we have the following um, the typical notations. So like G sub IJ, that's the IJth component of the metric, as it's called, So the or the induced metric to be more, more precise. Here's the matrix of the metric, E, F, F, G, we've seen that before. And the matrix of the second fundamental form, L, M, M, N. And again, we've seen that before. Um, and he, he uses H, I, J for that. And then finally, the third fundamental form, E, I, J. I don't really do anything with that just yet. So I just included it for completeness, but it really doesn't enter the discussion much. Now, the shape operator is not defined as we had defined it in O'Neill, though. Um, in sections 3A and 3B, of this book, um, he just he uses the Gauss map to define the shape operator. In particular, the following the following uh, scheme is used. So, of course, you've got a patch up onto the surface, right? But on the other hand, you can make this mapping from the domain of the patch or the parameter space, if you like, over to the sphere. And the way you do that basically is very simple. You take the unit um, the unit normal field, which you can derive from the patch, right? By partial x u cross partial x v, or partial x u1 cross partial x u2. Uh, um, normalize that thing that gives you the unit normal field, and then just imagine taking those and identifying these vectors with the corresponding points in the two-sphere. I mean, you can do that, because these all point to the edge of the two-sphere, and of course you can identify points with vectors. Now, to be more specific, this mapping, um, this Gauss map, new is, um, you know, the normalized, basically the normalized unit, normal vector field, and this this thing I just made up, this is not in, 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 in Wolfgang's book, this is this is a, this is just something I made up. P, basically I'm saying take the vector and 
turn it to a point. <laughs> okay, so this is this stupid uh, point map converts uh, vectors to corresponding points. So point uh, the, the the point map acting on this vector gives me back this point. All right. Now we we always abuse this mapping and don't write it down, but it, it okay. There it is. Uh, if you want to be well, almost precise. Um, so that that's the Gauss map, and then the shape operator is defined in terms of the push forward of the Gauss map and the push forward of the patch, but the inverse of that, which exists because we assume the map is regular, of course. Now, to be to to sort of envision how this works, so think about this: the um, push forward of the uh, you know inverse map. Well, so. If this is x, the um, the inverse map, right, would go the opposite way. So the push forward, the in, push forward inverse, push forward goes this way from this tangent space over that tangent space, which I have not pictured. But um, oppositely, the push, the inverse push forward from for x would go this way, and then the push forward of the Gauss map would go from here over there, right. So, <clears throat> hmm. So I suppose I'm, I'm, I may be actually, I may technically be missing a yet another identification here or something. Um, thinking. Well, I mean, we know the shape operator should be a mapping from the tangent space of M to the tangent space of M, right? So, hmm. Doesn't seem like this thing ends up at the tangent space M, so I must, I must be must be missing something here. Hmm, what am I missing? How do we get the back to the tangent space of M when we got over here? Um, I suppose then that's just the natural identification, right? And this is a subtle point, but. Um, <laughs> Oh man, there's another yet another mapping here um, because if you think about a fixed particular point here, right? Let me make a little. Think about suppose we're talking about a vector which doesn't push forward to that that point right there, right? Well, then you can envision the tangent space, right, to that point on the two sphere with let's say the unit normal like that, right? And um, let's say unit normal. Um, of the two sphere, right? At that point, goodness gracious, so much notation. But of course, that is the same unit normal as the corresponding point over here, right? Like, uh, if I started from this point, right? Then that point P is um, well over here. It's not really. Let's, if, if this is P, right, the point over here we, we would be at would be, it wouldn't be P again. The, the point here would be, it would be at U of P, but, oh goodness gracious, the notation here is so awful. Um, <laughs> the point map of U of P, which is in the two sphere, all right. Well, I hope I have thoroughly confused you at this point, but um, even this isn't quite accurate because... You know, again, this would this would make the shape operator mapping from the tangent space of M to the tangent space of the sphere, but that's not it either, right? So there's like another mapping that ident naturally identifies this tangent plane with the tangent plane. Of course, they share the same normal, right? Because the point U of P has normal U of P. That's the cool thing about the sphere, and that's what part of what drives this whole construction. So you know, the fact that P has the tangent space of P has unit normal u of p. Well, so the tangent space u of p on the two-sphere also has unit normal u of p, so there's a natural, um, you know, you can basically take this and stick it back over here, and that sticking it back over here map, which I have yet to give a name to, um, goodness gracious, uh, since I, I have to write small, let's, let's call it curly f. So there's like you know, minus curly F to push forward to that map. Oops. No. 
Or you could just say F. I mean, I could forget about the push push forward and just say F is a mapping on the tangent spaces. But anyway, I, I'm going to stop talking about it. I think I've said enough to confuse you. So I, I, I can I can my job is my job is done here. All right. So that's the shape operator, which um, you know. So the shape operator is it's 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 all wrapped up in these identifications which are made in this other way of thinking, all right, which are based upon fortunate coincidences between the surface and the two-sphere and the relation of the normal therein. So, here's the... There's also an interesting relation between the uh, the matrix of the shape operator and the second fundamental form. It goes like this. So, um, the second fundamental form, as I presented it, would naturally be um, for, you know, you'd have derivatives of the unit normal with uh, with, a, with that product of that with the, with the partial velocity, but um, the usual vector calculus shows you that you can also write it as just the unit normal dot the second partial, you know, second derivatives of the patch. So, on the flip side, um, if you calculate the shape operator acting on this partial velocity, or this, if you like, you have you have this matrix with the the, the uh, j up upward up upstairs rather than downstairs, so you can you can plug that in, right? And uh, when you do that, you get this lovely form this lovely calculation here. That um, of course this gives you the, the upstairs h, and on the on the flip side this is all h i k. But the dot product of the partial velocity gives me the g j k. And then you can solve this for, for that if you use the inverse to the metric. Um, and that's inverse as a matrix, all right? Um, it's, it's not... <laughs> it's the inverse to the matrix of the metric, all right? It's, um, the inverse metric is not a function from R back to the cross product of the tangent... to the Cartesian product of the tangent space with itself. It's not that kind of inverse. It's the inverse to the matrix of the metric, just to you know, be clear. Um, and um, so you, you solve for that, and out pops this raising index formula, right? I use the inverse of the metric to raise the k index to up, upstairs to j, and so there's this this relation, this raising index relation between the shape operator and the second fundamental form, which would make you happy if you had studied raising and lowering indices, or make make you unhappy because you don't have a good sense of why this is happening, and, and I don't either at the moment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So other other notations that are worth talking about briefly, if 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 not at all. Um, I mean, actually, this this is important. I mean, the larger story here, uh, Vermontian geometry, of course. You know, a lot of people use this kind of viewpoint. Um, you know, the, of course, the metric is central in Vermontian geometry, right? So this is the metric. Um, here it's induced, though, all right, from the ambient uh, Euclidean space. And you got your EFG. Sometimes the older notation doesn't have the tensor in it. You just, uh, you know, give the infinitesimal distance in terms of du squared and du dv and dv squared. Um, you can talk about the integral um, over with respect to area in terms of the square root of the determinant of the matrix. Um, and, um, of course, that's the area form. Now, um, symmetry of the shape operator, the, that the calculations also in these sections, was one of the more interesting little bits I'll share with you. So if I wanted to show that, actually show that the first, um, first fundamental form is symmetric, I need the symmetry of the shape operator to do that, and the calculation goes something like this. So this is... When you actually work out the shape operator acting on the UI partial velocity, that's by definition this. Oh, I've, I see now I'm, I haven't written my funny F map, but that F map is really doesn't do anything to the formulas. It just moves things around, <laughs> so it's not too bad. A, 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 a it's a sin of omission, mostly, not, not commission. Um, anyway, so partial partial U, UJ is what this works out to. Um, we worked that out a while ago, but um, in the utilda stuff, so I, I think that's fair. This is actually the chart, because the, it's the inverse of the patch, right? But um, anyway, when this 
when the derivative of the Gauss map acts on this vector field, well, that's the same as the vector field differentiating the Gauss map. Um, and so there you have it. That is why this gives you that. And then the usual vector calculus, the, the Leibniz rule, the product rule, um, at work here. Of course, the um, partial velocity and the unit normal are perpendicular, so that dot product is zero and gives you this. But by pretty much the same calculation, uh, if I start the opposite way with ui, with, with x, u, uh, the ith partial velocity here, shape operator of the jth partial velocity, then symmetry of the first fundamental form, or in other words, symmetry of the dot product, uh, gives me this. And then by the same calculation I just did up here, that gives me the same, same, same thing except with partial square root of uji. But because these are equal, it follows then that the first fundamental form um, is symmetric, uh, well, excuse me, what's the word? Um, yeah, the first fundamental form is, is symmetric. Um, mm, well, I'm sorry, that's not what I'm showing. It's the first fundamental, we, we know the first fundamental form is symmetric, that's just that dot product. <sighs> Sadness. Words, 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 words. <laughs> this shows that that S is symmetric with respect to the first fundamental form, or in, in, in more modern terminology, I suppose, is S is self-adjoint um, with respect to the uh, first fundamental form. All right. So, of course, as I was mentioning, there is much, much more to uh, learn, um, but we're out of time for this for the moment. I'm going to skip ahead at this point and, and go over to Tap's book now. Now, maybe some sometime later I'll come back and fill in these few lectures where we, we would, would go on to more abstract things like curvature and the Riemann tensor and, and all the fun stuff which is in the later chapters of, of, of this lovely book. But not for today. Thanks.